I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this first edition of this autumn school of near immunopharmacology, which we will uh, give for PhD students and postdoc researchers here at our university. So my main aim in this introduction is just to give you a presentation of the course and just a few information about uh, the state of the art uh, of uh, this, I don't know, it, I sh could say brand new discipline because we talk about uh, neuroimmunology, neuroimmunopharmacology, neuro, endocrino, psycho, immuno, and something else since a lot of time. But uh, the, the, the idea, the, the, the feeling is that it is always something new, uh, just because may, maybe uh, we just need to explain to the scientific community all the potential of this uh, interdisciplinary field of research and also this field which is giving a lot of application in, uh, in medicine. And so please, I will start very briefly with a few also historical presentation of this field uh, of uh, uh, science and research. And first of all, I would like to start from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, over the last few years, Wikipedia just became a few our, I don't know how to say, maybe just uh, our collective, uh, uh, not unconscious, but maybe conscious knowledge. Every one of us just uh, refers to this uh, source of knowledge, and someone said that it's even better than British Encyclopedia. And so in Wikipedia, you can find some uh, very good uh, uh, information. First of all, about neuroimmunology. You can find, for instance, that neuroimmunology exists since a lot of time uh, and is defined uh, as a field which combines neuroscience uh, and immunology and is mainly involved in the study of, uh, uh, in particular, the pathology of certain neurological diseases, and some of which have a clear uh, uh, immunological basis. In some way, uh, neuroimmunology is quite familiar to a lot of not only scientists, but also uh, physicians, but a lot of people think that neuroimmunology is just involved in the study of the immunology of central nervous system disease. And of course, for instance, multiple sclerosis, but also in the peripheral nervous system, some neuropathy. But if you go to the information which is provided by Wikipedia, uh, this is another very interesting feature of the, of the, the, of the web, you can trace back the, the story of this, in particular of this web page, and you can discover that this web page just exists from 2006. And this is over time uh, how this page uh, grew up. And so you can also uh, try to find some different page, uh, because neuroimmunology is not the, the only one page in Wikipedia. For instance, you can find that in Wikipedia there is also a page uh, even bigger, dedicated to psycho-neuroimmunology, and you can discover that this page just existed since two years before. It's, it's not so much, apparently. We are talking about 2004, of course. It's just a few days ago. But uh, psycho-neuroimmunology is something more, and it seems to me that this course in particular will be we we'll focus uh, better in the field of psychoneuroimmunology, not only neuroimmunology. You can see maybe that according to this definition, and this seems to me we can agree very much with this definition, psychoneuroimmunology, PNI, is the study of the interaction between psychological processes uh, of the nervous and the immune system in the human body, and PNI uh, it takes an inter interdisciplinary approach incorporating a lot of discipline, not only neuroscience and immunology, but also psychology, physiology, pharmacology, and of course uh, the target of this course uh, would be also pharmacology, also in the sense of uh, potential therapeutic applications, but also uh, at the, the, the molecular level and also at the behavioral uh, level, and also endocrinology, and also rheumatology, and also infectious disease, and also a lot of things. So it seems to me nearly everything, and maybe this is, this is the right key to see uh, this interdisciplinary field. It seems to me that it's, it's just a field that tries to go back uh, from 
uh, very, very specialized disciplines to uh, try to recollect uh, all the, the homeostasis, the holistic approach, not only in medicine, but also in biology and the, in the understanding of the functioning uh, of the organisms and also the well-being of, uh, of uh, uh, humans. And so what about the history? When uh, this uh, inter the interdisciplinary field, uh, when we can say that uh, it started to be a, a science? Of course, we could go back in the history of medicine, maybe back to the roots and uh, talking about holistic approaches also from a philosophical point of view. But I just would like to mm, give you some information about when uh, uh, psychoneuroimmunology began to be considered a, a, a research field in the scientific uh, meaning, uh, also uh, by the scientific community. And it seems to me that we can trace back to the 70s, uh, and in particular to this kind uh, of publication. This is very classical publication, maybe the first one. I don't know if Reiner will agree with, with this. Uh, may, may, maybe no. Your you're right, of course, it, because, because you think ab about the identification of uh, some receptors uh, in the central and the peripheral nervous system and neuropeptides. Of course, of course, we can, we can, dis we can, we can discuss about this, but it's, it seems to me that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious, we can, we, can, we can expect that we can trace back to different, uh, to different uh, sources uh, because this is an, an interdisciplinary uh, field and a lot of people contributed to understand that the nervous system, the immune system and the endocrine system and it seems to me all the main systems which are involved in the homeostasis of the, of the body are just very closely interconnected and it's very difficult to, understand, uh, to identify the, a hierarchy of these systems and uh, and also some kind of uh, of uh, only one way relationship because all these relationships are all two three or more or more uh, ways but in any case uh, a lot of texts uh, mm, just uh, mention uh, this kind of classical uh, experiments which are concerned uh, with the possibility, and it seems to me this is uh, uh, not a so familiar concept, uh, e even if uh, we are talking about something which was discovered about 40 or 50 years ago, but uh, still now a lot of physicians, in, in particular physicians, are, are absolutely not familiar with this concept and are usually very surprised when you talk about this. For instance, that you can condition uh, the immune response by classical, classical behavioral paradigms. Behaviorally conditioned immunosuppression. What was this classical experiment by Eder and Cohen? It was just very classical and simple. These experiments were performed in rodents. This is just the core of their, of their results. They performed a classical uh, behavioral conditioning by uh, giving some, some uh, um, sweet water, uh, just water with saccharin, um, to rats, uh, they gave this water uh, independent stimuli to, together with uh, um, an immunosuppressant. In this case, cyclophosphamide, a very strong immunosuppressant. And later, they immunized uh, uh, these animals uh, with uh, uh, red blood cells from sheep. And they just measured the uh, amount, the level, the concentration of uh, uh, immunoglobulins of antibodies against red blood cells. And what they found, this is just the control group. This is just the, the placebo group. And this is what they obtained when, after uh, initial conditioning, they just gave, again, challenge with the antigen, but together, together with sweet water. And you see that this is positive control, and this is a, a challenge with antigen, but it's cyclophosphamide, and you obtain complete uh, abolition of the immune response. But this is what you obtain with increasing amounts of just sweet water. Uh, placebo effect, uh, conditioned, uh, behaviorally conditioned immunosuppression. 
And this, of course, even in that experiment, they, uh, these researchers also showed that this response was absolutely specific because they did the same paradigm, but not with a immunosuppressant, but just with uh, an, another very unpleasant uh, drug, which was uh, uh, lithium salts. But in this case, just unpleasant, just to say that it was a very strong uh, sensation, very strong feeling for the animal. But in this case, you see that no immunosuppression is, uh, is evident. So immunosuppression just induced by uh, condition stimuli was specific for the effect of the drug. This, of course, this finding has, of course, enormous implications. And now, if you are uh, asking yourself if this is just uh, something which happens in rats, of course, uh, this happens also in humans. This is a very recent publication by the group of Manfred Shedlovsky, who will be with us uh, tomorrow morning and who will be in charge of the, the um, section of this course dedicated to, to psychoneuroimmunology. And uh, he does absolutely the same in humans. Uh, in this case, uh, it is a condition taste aversion paradigm in which uh, the taste uh, of uh, not, not, not so pleasant uh, taste on some substance uh, is coupled to the injection of cyclosporin and uh, levels of cyclosporin. And then he shows very nicely and very clearly that, for instance, this is levels of production of IL-2 and, and interferon gamma. It shows very clearly that when uh, there is rechallenge just with taste and no more with cyclosporin, in the group uh, which is treated uh, in, the, in the first paradigm with cyclosporin, you can see very well, uh, very similar effect, uh, just uh, uh, similar to the effect which is obtained uh, with uh, uh, with drug. I don't know if I should say with true drug or not, but this is something which is, can be biologically induced and can be also, I think that Manfred will tell us about, about all his studies, and also this kind of response can be very selectively blocked with some pharmacological manipulation, for instance, uh, with beta blockers, uh, which, as maybe you know, uh, not only block classical beta adrenoceptors on some uh, um, organs and tissues like uh, heart and vessels, but also beta adrenoceptors which are expressed in immune cells uh, and which for a lot of decades were considered the main way of talking uh, uh, by the nervous system to the immune uh, system. And so it seems to me this is a very important uh, one, one of the main origins of modern, uh, not only neuroimmunology, but the psychoneuroimmunology also involving behavior and learning. Another, it seems to me, very important field of research which contributed to the, to the birth of this interdisciplinary field uh, is also the understanding that uh, uh, the immune system uh, is uh, uh, very closely wired with the nervous system. It seems to me that uh, Professor Straub, uh, who will talk to us uh, in the second part of this morning and in the first part of the afternoon, uh, will tell us uh, a lot of things about about this in particular, in, uh, in the, but not only in autoimmune disease. But uh, I would like now to refer just uh, a little to this area of research uh, we, we, and the first publications were in the, in the end of 70s and the beginning of uh, 80s. Sympathetic innervation of morisimus and spleen, evidence for a functional link and so on. This is, was mainly in the work of the, the um, group of uh, uh, Felton and they did a lot in this case. For instance, they provided just basic evidence, now it seems very basic evidence, but through uh, many uh, anatomical and immunohistological approaches, they showed in a lot of uh, tissues and organs, in thymus, in spleen, uh, appendix, lymph nodes, and mesenteric lymph nodes, and so on, the presence of a lot of fibers, in particular sympathodrenergic fibers, but not only, also a lot of neuropeptides like CCK, like NPY, and, and so on. And they provided the basis uh, uh, to begin to uh, uh, ask 
uh, what would be what could be the functional role of all this wiring uh, of the lymphoid uh, tissue and in the same years uh, this is a very classical text uh, uh, book for this uh, for this field of research other Cohen and Felton published uh, the first edition of psychoneuroimmunology uh, now it seems to me, I don't know if there is a recent edition, maybe no, maybe no. We are the four, four, fourth edition. Fourth edition a few years ago, 2006. It seems to me it's very important uh, textbook in this, uh, for, for all the specialists interested in this, in this field of research. What happened next? Okay, a lot of things. Uh, my choice is just uh, arbitrary uh, because we could now follow different uh, different paths uh, to modern neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology. First of all, the notion that neuropeptides affect immune cells. In the meanwhile, in the same years, uh, there was a, a great uh, growth of interest uh, in the physiology and pharmacology and molecular biology of a lot of different immune cell types, in particular in the innate immunity, monocytes and microphages. Uh, and so a lot of people began to, to uh, study, for instance, the effect on neuropeptides on immune cells. This is a lot of, uh, um, a lot of papers, uh, for instance, from the, the, the same laboratory of people who were involved in the study of neuropeptides in the central nervous system. Maybe you know about Solomon Snyder, who just found uh, um, opioid peptides and opioid receptors and from uh, his lab was uh, Candace Pert who was a researcher that, that a young researcher at that time and she published a lot of papers in this uh, in this field in particular one of these papers this was a science paper uh, about the effect of benzodiazepine like peptides on monocytes microphages and this was not not so old paper it's about uh, half of 90s and this paper was very useful for instance to our group uh, for one of our initial studies about the effect of endosepine like peptides uh, on the phys physiology and pharmacology of human neutrophils and this was maybe one of our uh, papers maybe not in the mainstream of our interest in neuroimmunology but i think it's nice to remember also this kind of studies we performed in the in the uh, in the 90s, for instance, we show that this endosepine-like peptides, which are something like uh, benzodiazepines, like the diazepam, uh, they bind to the same uh, receptors and they are able to affect very much innate immune cells, for instance, like human neutrophils. In this case, we studied the responses of intracellular calcium. The, the responses related to the oxidative metabolism of uh, these cells and also the responses uh, uh, related to the production. It seems to me maybe this is ILH. It's right, Franca. It was maybe it was ILH or it was chemotaxis. Chemotaxis. ILH was another paper. Just to see that there is a, a lot to understand about the role of these neurotransmitters and neuropeptides in the modulation of the immune and the immune response. But, but. Neuropeptides and the nervous system affects immune system and just again central role of the nervous system. But also the immune system affects very much, very much the nervous system. Uh, this is the concept of sixth behavior. Cytokines affect behavior. The sixth behavior, in particular, the role of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the modulation of, uh, uh, of just behavior. The concept of sixth sense behavior is something which is uh, driven from periphery. Uh, sixth sense behavior, of course, what is sixth sense behavior? Is what uh, each of us just experiences, just in, just in flu, for instance, when we feel tired. When we decide, okay, today we would not like to go to laboratory, we would not like to go to classroom. Oh, it's first day, of course, but maybe we can go another day. And this is just the effect when we have, for instance, infections or just some systemic disease. It's the, the effect, for instance, for infection of the activation of the innate immune response. So it's very basic, very, very primitive uh, uh, response of the organism to some disease with a very strong meaning uh, of uh, uh, reconstitution of homeostasis. We just need to rest, to allow body to heal. 
of uh, course, you can understand also how psychoneuroimmunology is a very delicate field of research because these kind of concepts uh, can be very easily uh, taken and taken outside of conventional medicine just to justify or to emphasize some kind of complementary not not so conventional medicine and also just some different uh, uh, systems which are not serious science. Uh, but it seems to me this is an, another, an additional reason why we should be able to address uh, these very, very important uh, uh, mechanisms and uh, phenomena in a very serious and scientific way to understand some very basic uh, behavior of our, of our body. In this case, sickness behavior, what is sickness behavior? For instance, it decreased general activity, decreased exploratory behavior, decreased social and sexual behavior, decreased food and water intake, decreased preference for sweets, and uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of different things, which are now, uh, we clearly know a lot of mechanisms uh, which link this behavior to the immune activation, and which uh, all uh, bring uh, to uh, a kind of behavior which is uh, rest and which is something with, with very uh, well defined uh, uh, molecular and uh, transmitter endocrine and modulator basis which should all lead to a behavior uh, which should help body to heal in to heal itself uh, or also to help uh, uh, just cures and therapeutics to better heal the body. Of course, this is very easily shown in the case of uh, infectious disease, but the same mechanism occur also in uh, several kinds of uh, uh, inflammatory situations, uh, not only and not necessarily primarily triggered by infectious uh, uh, agents. And so, uh, just a few uh, references to our uh, history or our story, maybe just story, why we are involved in, in neuroimmunology and in this field of uh, research. Our interest in particular here in, in Varese stems from an additional uh, approach to the field of uh, psychoneuroimmunology, which is the, the approach which regards the ability of the immune system to uh, produce not only classical uh, immune mediators like cytokines and chemokines and a lot of uh, different peptides, but also uh, classical, traditional neurotransmitters. In particular, we were uh, very much interested uh, with uh, neurotransmitters like uh, uh, noradrenaline and uh, uh, dopamine and also uh, neuroendocrine mediators like adrenaline. How we started, just to say how interdisciplinary is this field, uh, we, in particular I, 20 years ago, was a young researcher, <laughs> and it was already 20 years now, and, and the same uh, my colleague, uh, Franco Marino. When we started to uh, um, organize the laboratory of pharmacology in, uh, in Varese, we were then the faculty of the second faculty of medicine, the University of Pavia, but we moved to Varese. And when we moved to Varese, of course, uh, we brought to this place uh, what we were doing in, uh, in, uh, in, our, in our labs uh, where we began our, uh, our story. And for instance, my PhD uh, dissertation was about uh, uh, neuropeptides and neurotransmitters in the enteric nervous system. And uh, while uh, uh, Franca was involved in the adrenergic neurotransmission uh, in the peripheral nervous system, and so we had a lot of uh, uh, nice and very traditional, very simple, classical pharmacological approaches to study this kind of, this kind of neurotransmission. And moving to Varese, it seems to me it was very lucky serendipity in this case, as, as usually we can say. We, be, we uh, happen to be uh, neighbors uh, to Giorgio Maestroni in, uh, in Lucano. We will have Giorgio Maestroni already tomorrow for his first uh, lecture. And I think he's another father of classical uh, neuro and psycho neuroimmunology. Uh, I will introduce you Giorgio Maestroni tomorrow, but 
I uh, am also very happy to remember how much uh, I am grateful to uh, Professor Maestroni for uh, all the things he taught us in the field of neuroimmunology. And in that, uh, in that situation, nearly 20 years ago, when we met uh, with Giorgio Maestroni in, the, uh, in a congress of immunopharmacology we organized here in, in Varese, he was dealing with some very practical problem in uh, one of his experimental models. Uh, he, he dealt for uh, a lot of years uh, with the physiology and pharmacology and physiopathology of uh, um, urine-endocrine systems, and in particular, uh, he was involved in the study of melatonin. Maybe he gave one of the biggest contributions to the understanding of the role of the neuroendocrine and immune role of melatonin. But in that case, he was working on a, on a model in, in mouse uh, and was a model of bone marrow transplantation. His main hypothesis was that some effect that he observed in transplantation of, uh, of uh, autologous bone marrow after uh, mice were, have been uh, irradiated should have something to do with light and with melatonin. Uh, but, but this was not the case since his experiments uh, uh, gave just different results as those that he expected. And so he moved uh, to some hypothesis involving the innervation of, uh, um, of the bone marrow. And this is why uh, I, sh I showed you in previously the work by Felton and a lot of work which shows that uh, lymphoid organs and also the bone marrow is absolutely rich in a, in a lot of innervation, and in particular in sympathetic innervation. And so it was absolutely natural to begin to discuss uh, together with Maestroni about this uh, this topic and to decide just uh, to use our approaches uh, to study the adrenergic neurotransmission in the peripheral nervous system and to apply these approaches to the study of bone marrow physiology. This was why uh, we began, for instance, to um, assay the levels of uh, uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline and the bone marrow in, uh, just in, uh, in control animals and in animals uh, uh, which Giorgio Mestroni just denervated uh, uh, by both chemical and surgical procedures. And what we found? We found a lot of uh, uh, just nice things. Uh, for instance, first of all, like the title of this paper just says, that neural and endogenous catecholamines are in some way associated uh, with, uh, uh, they show a circadian rhythm and also are associated with the hematopoietic process in this, uh, in this mouse model. But also additionally, what we found is, was also that uh, we expected a, a very uh, strong uh, um, a very strong uh, reduction of catecholamine levels in the moon marrow of denervated uh, animals, uh, but this was not the case since in denervated animals, for instance, we just saw uh, abolition of circadian rhythms, but a lot, a lot of catecholamines uh, which still were present, and so we just try to understand maybe uh, adrenal glands, maybe a lot of other things, and then we decided to assay, uh, directly to assay bone marrow cells, uh, and not only bone marrow cells, but just some cell lines uh, to avoid possible interference by systemic uh, uh, adrenal uh, catecholamines, and we began to find the first evidence, this table, this is just different cell lines from bone marrow and different, uh, uh, no, different uh, cultures from uh, short-term and long-term bone marrow cultures, but also different cell lines uh, mainly related to innate immunity and to hematopoietic precursors. And mm, we began to find uh, uh, very significant amounts of noradrenaline, of adrenaline, and also of dopamine. This is why we got involved. Uh, we just, in a few years, we just completely left our initial uh, studies about peripheral nervous system, the pharmacology of this peripheral nervous system, and began to study the uh, physiopharmacology of catecholamines, uh, which are also closely interrelated uh, uh, from the biochemical point of view, but we will discuss this later in another lecture, in another section of this course. And we began to, to study, uh, of course, this was one of our main references uh, not only because this is a very nice cartoon sh showing the role of uh, uh, catecholamines and the interplay between the nervous system and the immune system through both wiring connections uh, and uh, uh, endocrine uh, connections, 
but also because this was a, a cartoon uh, very important to, uh, for us and which brought us uh, to be in touch with Rainer Straub, uh, who I will be very pleased to introduce you after the end of my lesson and to whom also we are very, very greatly indebted for a lot of things we did in the field of, uh, of neuroimmunology after, after our initial studies uh, 20 years ago. And we uh, began to study uh, the role of uh, uh, catecholamine production by immune cells, uh, uh, and this, uh, this, will be the, this will be the topic of some uh, other lectures uh, in, the, uh, in the next days of this, uh, of this uh, uh, course. And so uh, where we are now, where we are now in, uh, in all these uh, uh, studies, which, uh, as you understand, uh, just involve nearly all fields of biology and, uh, and medicine. I will just you give you some, some, just some uh, uh, hint of what people are doing around the world. Uh, for instance, I like very much this kind of studies. These are studies which are, are mainly performed in, by some groups uh, in, uh, in uh, Israel, mainly, mainly Mika Schwarz uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, the group of Kipnis. And these studies just clearly show in animal models, and not, not only in animal models, but in particular in mice and rats, where of course it's very easy to manipulate the immune system, that the immune system is absolutely essential and fundamental for uh, the uh, maturation for the ontology of the nervous system. For instance, this, this paper in Nature Neuroscience, immune cells contribute to the maintenance of neurogenesis and spatial learning abilities in adulthood in rodents. They show the presence not only of the uh, uh, nervous system in immune cells like microglia, but also of uh, uh, true T cells, uh, which in very few amounts uh, are nonetheless fundamental for the uh, right development of very critical uh, areas of the, of the nervous system, like limbic system, hippocampus, and, uh, and so And they show, for instance, that if you uh, abolish the cellular immune response in, uh, in mice, uh, in just young mice, you have uh, a lot of problems with the development of cognitive uh, behavior, which can just be uh, uh, eliminated by uh, reinfusion of immune uh, of immune cells, and of course, a lot of people uh, after this kind of results just show. This is another paper by by the uh, group of uh, Kipnis that uh, lymphocytes uh, can uh, directly talk uh, with neurons. In this case, of course, in uh, in vitro, but it can directly talk through a lot of mechanisms involving uh, involving cytokines and chemokines, which we saw they can directly affect uh, neural cells. Maybe through classical neurotransmitters, uh, which uh, lymphoid cells can produce, and also through the interconnection through classical uh, molecular pathways like those uh, uh, of the major uh, histocompatibility complex, uh, which are also uh, molecules that. Uh, now we know that also uh, neurons and glial cells can uh, express, maybe to low uh, levels, so that can express, and they are very important in the, in the regulation of the activity of these uh, cells. And again, the notion that lymphocytes can cross the blood-blame barrier, when I graduated in medicine, this was just a, a her heretic uh, idea. The, the brain was just an immune sanctuary, and maybe in a lot of textbooks you still find this kind of, of uh, concept. But now we know that in, uh, in very, to very low degree, but in peripheral immune cells uh, just uh, uh, cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and patrol the central nervous system and uh, um, dialogue with uh, um, neural cells, uh, glial cells, and possibly also uh, neurons. This is a very recent paper, for instance, Journal of Clinical Investigation, and a couple of years ago, showing that in particular a new degeneration in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease after death, you can uh, demonstrate the presence uh, of a mm, very significant amount of T cells, and which kind of T cells? They formed in particular 
uh, T helper sensor of type 1 and also of type 17, uh, which maybe you know is a very uh, recently described uh, a subset of T helper cells which are believed to play a very important role in, uh, in uh, inflammation and in autoimmune disease. And uh, uh, according to the data of, uh, of uh, this group, uh, uh, which also used uh, um, experimental animal models in neurodegenerations, they suggest that uh, uh, T lymphocytes can uh, uh, come in into the nervous system. Uh, they can interact with, with microglia and induce uh, this uh, uh, nervous system immune cells to produce a lot of factors which can be either detrimental or neuroprotective uh, for the nervous system. Uh, people who are involved in this kind of research are trying to develop a paradigm according to which uh, uh, TLP1 or TLP17 cells just activate microglia in a, a pro inflammatory way. Uh, which finally results uh, in, uh, in uh, neural damage and neurodegeneration, both chronic and maybe also acute, for instance, like in ischemia and uh, in hemorrhagic uh, diseases of, uh, of the nervous system. While TLP2-like uh, uh, cells and the uh, acquired immune response can drive uh, the microglia to a more neuroprotective uh, phenotype just through the production of a lot of... Uh, neurotrophic uh, factors. And also in, in all this uh, uh, system, a role is also suggested for another uh, uh, very important and also from our point of view, very interesting uh, uh, subset uh, of uh, um, T lymphocytes, which are the so-called regulatory subset. Uh, uh, there are a lot we will see uh, later to today. We will have Professor Akola who will talk to us about uh, uh, tumor, um, anti-tumor immunity, and I think that he will tell, you, tell us something about this topic. We, we have a lot of different subset of regulatory cells. Uh, uh, CD4 regulatory cells are just the most popular and most studies, but there are also CD8 and another a lot of different kinds of regulatory cells. Uh, someone talks, uh, speaks also about some regulatory role of B cells, uh, and uh, in particular over the last decades, a uh, uh, very, very important concept has been developed also about the regulatory role of some in innate immune system cells like monocytes. And so uh, this will be another very important focus of this uh, uh, course. And in particular, in the, ne in the next few days, uh, we will have uh, among the speakers of this course, uh, Howard Genderman uh, from the United States, uh, who uh, is also involved in this, kind, uh, uh, in this kind of studies. And another, another um, just an another suggestion, just another choice, it seems to me, from my point of view, very, very important and very, very interesting, not only the role of the immune system in the central nervous system, but also the role of neurotransmitters may be not only produced by uh, nervous system, but also by immune cells in the periphery. And this is uh, another, it seems to me, very stimulating uh, uh, topic with a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, implications in uh, different fields of uh, medicine, that is neurotransmitters and in particular catecholamines like noradrenaline and dopamine uh, in the regulation of angiogenesis. You know that angiogenesis, that is the generation of new vessels, is very important not only in ontogeny but also in a lot of uh, pathological processes. Uh, uh, just think about angiogenesis in the development uh, and spreading of tumors, uh, or also to angiogenesis, again, detrimental in uh, um, the, the generation which occurs uh, in atherosclerosis, and we will have uh, a session of this course all dedicated to cardiovascular disease and in particular to vascular degeneration, uh, but also think about the role of angiogenesis in the repair of tissues. Uh, not only uh, tissues like skin, but also tissues like heart. Uh, imagine angiogenesis after, after coronary heart uh, disease. And so the notion 
that this kind of systems, and uh, I uh, brought to you two uh, examples of very recent studies by another group, which is uh, the group uh, uh, of, uh, um, in particular, of uh, Sujit Basum, who will be another speaker in the next few days in this uh, course. Uh, and this group uh, made a lot of very brilliant studies, just showing on this right panel that uh, both noradrenaline, adrenergic pathways, and dopaminergic pathways are involved, for instance, in the regulation. This is, uh, this is a review in cancer research uh, dealing with the adrenergic and dopaminergic regulation uh, of tumor angiogenesis. They showed, for instance, uh, beta adrenergic mechanisms in cells from uh, uh, breast cancer. And so they suggest a very interesting explanation to a lot of epidemiological studies showing different risk of development, uh, primary and secondary development of breast cancer or of uh, a lot of other different cancers in people who just take drugs which interfere with beta adrenoceptor mediated uh, transmission. This is a very, a very uh, stimulating uh, um, topic in clinical oncology. But also they show that dopamine Dopamine not directly on cancer cells, but acting uh, on uh, receptors, which are probably expressed by endothelial cells, both normal and generated in, in tumors. Uh, maybe they suggest through D2-like receptors, but this is uh, absolutely a brand new area of research and a lot of work needs to be done. Dopamine can inhibit uh, by itself the process of angiogenesis. And so, of course, you understand the potential of dopaminergic agents, for instance, as add-on agents in the, in the um, uh, pharmacological treatment of tumors. And presently, we have a, a, a very nice project with Professor Akola, who is just one of the main experts of tumor uh, biology, and he has very nice uh, experimental models in this case. Uh, and uh, we were just uh, involved with him uh, in trying to uh, find an application for dopaminergic drugs uh, as an add-on uh, treatment uh, for biological therapies of, uh, of tumors. And this is a very, very recent, it's just still in, uh, in press study, again, again by the group of Sujit Bezu, uh, just showing the opposite, of course, is dopamine is able to inhibit uh, uh, new vessel formation. Dopaminergic antagonists uh, just can promote uh, um, angiogenesis and repair. In this case, uh, the focus was in repair of wounds, uh, and they show this very uh, quick uh, repair of wounds in animals uh, which were treated with dopamine antagonists, and they show that this is due to the uh, very quicker development of new vessels uh, and uh, repair of, uh, of, uh, of these wounds. Just to say, just to say the potential and so where we are now, we can talk truly about neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology. Of course, we are convinced that uh, from several years, from several decades, that we can talk about this new field and this, this field, maybe not so new, uh, and this discipline. But of course, uh, science is also made of scientists, and uh, each scientist is very eager of his, uh, of his own uh, field of research, and so immunologists would like uh, that all the world is made of, uh, of uh, immune system and of, and of immunology, and uh, neuroscientists would like that the whole world is made of central nervous system, but that they are the only scientists. And uh, you understand how difficult it can be to make accepted some so, uh, um, I would like to say, discipline with a very young spirit, uh, which needs to just to destroy barriers and to work uh, in a very interdisciplinary way and with a lot of uh, uh, open uh, mind, uh, but also open to collaboration between uh, uh, among scientists of different uh, fields. And this is, it seems to me, one of the main reasons uh, why uh, neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology uh, always found historically a lot of uh, um, obstacles in, in uh, its uh, uh, development. Nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, main uh, uh, how can I, how can I say? 
just uh, classical, most important, the, the authoritative uh, places for science and research, like very important uh, um, journals like Nature and Science, um, dedicated increasing space just to neuroimmunology. And for instance, this is a, a whole uh, um, number of a uh, whole issue of uh, nature reviews immunology, uh, which was dedicated a couple of years ago to neuroimmunology. And it seems to me this was just a very important opening from uh, um, a journal like, like nature, which of course is something like a noble part of, uh, of science. But, but why nature still is difficulty uh, with a lot of difficult uh, opens to neuroimmunology, but as I told you, this is neuroimmunology intended uh, as mainly as uh, the immune correlates of central nervous system disease and mainly autoimmune disease. It seems to me, and I like very much this concept, uh, a lot of people all around the world just agree that we are already in the era of neuroimmunopharmacology. And this is the, the scheme which is uh, the, the cartoon which is included uh, in, the, uh, in the introductory chapter of a uh, brand new uh, textbook, uh, which is this one, Neuroimmunopharmacology. One of the editors, again, is this our Gendeman that we will be we have in the next few days. And it seems to me that this cartoon shows very well how neuroimmune pharmacology stems at the intersection of neuroscience, immunology, and pharmacology, putting together a lot of different notions and a lot of different uh, um, fields of uh, research. Many of these fields which are classically absolutely separated and nearly uh, without um, interconnection and with dialogue with each other. And this is also why coming to our course you will have, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of this. I must say that I'm very proud. It seems to me it's a very, very important uh, uh, occasion for our university. We have a uh, lot of uh, um, speakers of uh, international level, which are just, uh, 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 how can I say, just very, very uh, important and renowned scientists in their fields. Uh, but we have not only uh, true uh, scientists involved uh, in neuroimmunology and like some, some maybe, maybe uh, parents of neuroimmunology like Rainer Straub we have today, like Giorgio Maestroni I told you about, like Manfred Shedlowski, uh, and it seems to me they are absolutely in the field of neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology. But we will have just classical uh, immunologists uh, excellent uh, classical immunologist like Roberto Colla, who is just now with us, like Flori Politi. Uh, she will give us her lecture in the next uh, few days. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, classical neurologists and neuroscientists, Antonio Uccelli and Mauro Zaffaroni, uh, mainly involved in the clinical uh, uh, research about multiple sclerosis and central nervous system autoimmune disease, but Fabio Blandini is, in the, is a, a clinical neurologist uh, uh, involved with neurodegeneration, and through pharmacologists, like for instance, Paolo Sacerdote from the University of Milan, uh, who nonetheless studied for a lot of time with Alberto Panerai, neuropeptides, and in particular opioid peptides in the immune system. And just to say very quickly that all these names are excellent names from all around the world and uh, are not just uh, uh, neuroimmunology or psychoneuroimmunology researchers, but most of them are just uh, neuroscientists, uh, um, clinical neurologists, or immunologists, basic or, or clinical. Just to say that neuroimmunology and neuropharmacology needs to be and at the intersection of all these disciplines and needs to put together uh, all these kind of scientists also to talk, to talk with each other and to share uh, not only knowledge but it seems to me first of all uh, approaches, uh, ideas, opinions uh, and uh, uh, methodologies.
And so, in the last part of my, my introductory talk, uh, just a, a few information about the state of the art uh, of uh, uh, neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology in the world. Just some uh, reference text. Of course, it's my choice, it's my responsibility. There are a lot of very good texts, but it seems to me that at present these are the main texts that uh, uh, everyone interested in, uh, in neuroimmunology and neuroimmune pharmacology could just consider, in particular neuroimmune pharmacology. I told you by Springer, uh, clinical neuroimmunology was a nice test that was uh, published a few years ago. And this immunology of the nervous system is an old text. This was never renewed, but it seems to me it's just classical, classical text. There are also some uh, books which are not necessarily only for specialists, uh, can be also approached by people not familiar with, uh, with the, the uh, scientific side of, uh, of, the, of the story, and a lot of nice books. In particular, this is Psychoneuroimmunology and uh, an Introduction, uh, again by Manfred Shedlovsky, who will be with us tomorrow, Balance Within by Esther Sturmberger, and this classical book, I think, uh, uh, nearly a lot of people know about Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, but I would like just to mention, because it has also it is also a very good, uh, maybe uh, only neuroscientific background, maybe, uh, but, but also maybe a, a, neuro, a, neuroimmunological, a neuroimmunological background. Uh, uh, I would like in some way also to mention, I didn't include in this presentation, but uh, uh, in some way in the field of neuroimmunology, and in particular of psychoneuroimmunology, we can mention also some concepts um, very, very unusual, uh, like, for instance, like some uh, books by uh, Dalai Lama, but it seems to me it's excessive in this, uh, in this uh, play, so I just, I just mentioned, I didn't include in my presentation. Uh, the field of neuroimmunology and of psychoneuroimmunology is also a field in which uh, uh, several uh, scientific societies and organizations stand, and maybe uh, several societies, and uh, as we were discussing yesterday evening with Rainer Straub and Flori Politi, some of these societies and initiatives uh, are also mm, doing not so good science. So it's very important to know, it seems to me, which, could be, uh, which can be the most uh, important uh, uh, reference uh, societies and organizations all around the world. And those societies just provide a very, very good uh, uh, reference, very good initiatives uh, for uh, research and also for teaching in the field of neuroimmunology and psychoneuroimmunology. First of all, it seems to me we need to mention the Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society. Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society was mainly the first, that's right. The first, and it seems to me, uh, I would like to say still most important, maybe mm, not exactly for the number of people, but for uh, the, the, uh, mm, the science which promotes in the field of psychoneuroimmunology and for the initiatives which promotes uh, a lot of uh, speakers in this course uh, are from uh, uh, Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society. First of all, Rainer Straub, uh, who also has been recently president of, of society and he is also in charge of uh, his German branch, that's right. And uh, um, NIRS uh, has an uh, uh, official uh, journal, which is Brain, Behavior and Immunity. It seems to me it's a journal that everyone who is interested in psychoneuroimmunology should always uh, uh, consider uh, uh, to read and also as a, as a target for his uh, publication. Manfred Czerlowski, I, I phoned, I, I, I didn't know, but Manfred is uh, uh, president-elect for the, the next, uh, for the next uh, uh, period. And uh, um, another very important society and uh, historical society in the field uh, of neuroimmunology, the International Society for Neuroimmunomodulation. Uh, this is uh, um, presently uh, the, the president uh, now is Hugo Bezidovsky, that's right. And uh, Hugo Bezidovsky, with uh, his wife Adriana de Rey, is another one who did a lot for, for uh, basic and clinical uh, uh, neuroimmunology. The International Society for Neuroimmunodulation, the so called ISNIM, uh, has uh, uh, its uh, uh, official journal, which is Neuroimmunomodulation by Carger. 
is now a very nice, uh, very nice uh, uh, journal. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, society is organized uh, in uh, several local branches. Uh, uh, an Italian branch doesn't exist, unfortunately, at least for, uh, for now. But in, uh, in Italy, it seems to me, maybe, Raina, that Maurizio Cutolo can be addressed and one of the main references for this uh, society. Maurizio Cutolo is a rheumatologist in, in, uh, in uh, Genoa. And uh, uh, among these uh, this, uh, branches, uh, of course, uh, in the ISNIM uh, is still involved in the executive committee, uh, Giorgio Maestroni. And uh, uh, the ISNIM has a lot of uh, local branches, and in particular, I would like to, to mention the Gabin uh, German Endocrine Brain Immune Network. Uh, we have here uh, Reiner. And this is one of the most active branches uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, ISNIM. And again, what else? This is a very uh, recent uh, uh, initiative, uh, mainly based in USA, the Society of Neuroimmune Pharmacology. Very recent, but also very rapidly uh, developing. And uh, the official uh, um, journal of this society is the Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology. Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology. Um, the editor in chief of the Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology, I already mentioned, uh, is uh, Howard Gendeman. He will be with, uh, with us, and this uh, journal uh, offered us to publish the proceedings of this, uh, of this course. So it seems to me it's very nice, very nice opportunity. And finally, finally, need to mention also the ISNI. The, uh, maybe this is the biggest society from the point of view of the number of people uh, who are associated with this international society, the International Society of Neuroimmunology, is very active in the field of neuroimmunology. This is a, a scientific society or, uh, concerned with neuroimmunology in the classical meaning that I told you about for neuroimmunology, that is the immunology of central nervous system disease. This is a, society which is very good for people who are mainly interested in central nervous system disease and in immunological correlates of this disease and so like in particular multiple sclerosis and some uh, immune uh, based uh, neur neuropathies. Uh, this is a society with a lot of Italian people in particular the vice president now is Gian Vito Martino from San Raffaele Institute in, in, uh, in Milan. The official journal of this society is the Journal of Neuroimmunology, which nonetheless is a uh, very good in general journal for all the fields of neuroimmunology, maybe not exactly for psycho, for psycho neuroimmunology. And uh, um, the ISNI, uh, since a lot of time, also supports a European school of neuroimmunology, which now is about in its six or seven, it seems to me, courses, a very nice course, uh, but uh, as I told you, mainly devoted to uh, neurology and to uh, the, the issues uh, uh, con concerned with uh, inflammation in the nervous system, in particular central nervous system and a few peripheral nervous systems. So it's very different from, uh, from uh, maybe com not complementary, but just uh, uh, more focused on one area of uh, uh, psychoneuroimmunology, just with the neurological side of neuroimmunology. Uh, and uh, finally, we just also need to mention uh, the Associazione Italiana di Neuroimmunologia, the so-called AINI, which in some way is a branch of, uh, of um, and it seems to me at present, unfortunately, in Italy is the only uh, scientific society which is very active in the field of neuroimmunology. So it seems to me we need some additional initiative in this, uh, in this field. But in any case, AIN is very active, it's a very young uh, society. It seems to be very useful for young researchers interested in this, uh, in this field. And finally, this is a summary of what I showed you. And uh, uh, I would like just to mention uh, uh, the latest initiative in this field. Uh, this is Brain Immune. Uh, Brain Immune is an initiative uh, which was developed uh, uh, many things to me by the initiative of uh, uh, our common friend Ilya Elenkov, 
who is an excellent researcher in the field of neuroimmunology. He was for a lot of time here in Italy doing uh, uh, research also with Florid Politi. And uh, he was deeply concerned uh, with the, the um, sympathetic energetic modulation of immunity, in particular, and the role of stress on immunity. And now, over the last few years, he decided to develop this platform, uh, web-based, uh, who, which, uh, in, uh, in, uh, according to the purposes, uh, uh, would like to become one of the main uh, uh, reference points uh, with the philosophy of, of open access, one of the main reference points uh, for uh, uh, psycho-neuroimmunology on, uh, on uh, the web. And, uh, of course, before, before uh, uh, closing this presentation, uh, yesterday evening we were uh, talking with, uh, with Flora and Rainer about, about, uh, sci about science, and, of course, what to do uh, good research needs good science, but to do good science, of course, in particular uh, now, needs money. And uh, uh, as regards money, uh, this maybe is also uh, this is still a point uh, in which uh, uh, scientists, people involved in uh, psychoneuroimmunology sh should work, in my opinion, very much, because just a few uh, programs, national or international, are uh, specifically devoted to the field of neuroimmunology. I just mentioned this one because, as far as I know, this is the only uh, important program uh, worldwide which is uh, explici uh, explicitly dedicated to uh, research uh, in, the, in the field of neuroimmunology in the Dana Foundation. Unfortunately, uh, it is uh, some years that the Dana Foundation just restricted uh, its support uh, to uh, people who are based in the United States, uh, it seems to me, over the last five or ten, uh, or ten uh, years. There are a lot of different other uh, foundations and organizations which give money to people involved in immunology, but just because they are involved in the study of specific uh, diseases. For instance, uh, in, uh, in Italy, but also in the United States, the society is dedicated to multiple sclerosis and other diseases like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, this. So it seems to me we also need to some initiative to strengthen the uh, financial support to research, uh, in, uh, which is specifically dedicated to neuroimmunology and not only to neuroimmunological aspects of some disease. Of course, we found some support for this course, and so finally I, I would like to mention and to acknowledge uh, all the sources which rendered possible the, the organization of this course. First of all, the Insubra International Summer School. The Insubra International Summer School is an initiative by our um, university which supports uh, each, each year some uh, um, PhD and postdoctoral advanced summer schools in, in specific uh, fields. Uh, this year is the first year which uh, uh, the Insubra International Summer Schools gives a contribution to, to our, to our uh, research. Uh, of course, this is not a summer school, this is an autumn school, but uh, I, I hope that this will be not a reason for uh, the, our university to withdraw our <laughs> contribution to our, our school, but uh, uh, seriously, I hope that this uh, will be possible to continue also in the next few years. I would also like to thank the, the school, uh, the PhD school uh, in, uh, in uh, biological and medical sciences. Uh, we have uh, the president of the school, uh, who is uh, Professor Akolla. Uh, we will give uh, his lecture this, uh, this afternoon. And this school uh, is the platform which supports uh, all the PhD courses in uh, medical and biological sciences in our, in our, um, in our university. And in particular, uh, this course was made possible through the support of the uh, PhD course uh, in clinical and experimental pharmacology, uh, which is coordinated by Franca Marino, who is here and will give us a uh, lecture. Uh, and, uh, and also, this course is also included in the, in the teaching program of the School of Specialization in Medical Pharmacology, which is dedicated to uh, physicians in our faculty of medicine. 
And finally, also this course was uh, made possible also to, uh, by the, uh, through the contribution uh, of uh, a specific research project, which uh, I would like just to talk to you uh, um, a few, which is this Red Drug Train. Red Drug Train is just the, the acronym, the, 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 the name of this uh, project, which is a collaborative project uh, involving uh, uh, us as the group of medical pharmacologists now the Faculty of Medicine and the colleagues uh, of uh, um, organic and inorganic chemistry and the Faculty of uh, Sciences in, uh, in Como, which is the other branch of the University of, uh, of Insubria. And this is a, a program which started this year based uh, to give support to our PhD courses. And this is a, a program of teaching and research dedicated to PhD students intended to attract young, brilliant, of course, researchers. Everyone wants brilliant researchers. We need to practice in the field of drug innovation and in particular to acquire competence and experiences, novel methodologies for drug discovery. What does it mean and what this has to do with neuroimmunology? Uh, we developed uh, uh, two work packages dedicated to pharmacological modulation of protein interactions uh, involving well-defined secondary structure. This is the work mainly the work of our colleagues of, of chemistry and the rational development of multifunctional neuroimmunomodulating agents from botanical sources. And we aim to develop uh, uh, novel uh, molecules and novel approaches, in particular for neurological, neurodegenerative disease and for immuno-inflammatory disease. How and uh, in uh, which, which meaning? Basically by two uh, approaches, abs absolutely different, complementary. One comes from uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, chemistry, and the chemistry of Foldamers in particular, this is the field of research of our colleagues of, uh, of uh, chemistry. They are uh, able to project and develop specific uh, peptides uh, or peptidomimetic molecules like these ones, uh, uh, rationally developed to target uh, uh, It's like modulation of beta, the aggregation of beta amyloid and the, the triggering of neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's disease, and also in peptide mimetic ligands for integrins. And in this case, this field uh, was, uh, was uh, developed also in collaboration with some of, some of us because uh, this target can, of course, uh, uh, approach uh, both tumor angiogenesis but also inflammatory processes, and we have some nice collaborative project. And the other platform is uh, dedicated to phytoceuticals. It is just uh, the, the study and the characterization of the, not only the, the neural and the immune effects of molecules coming from botanical sources, and we know that some molecules uh, uh, from plants, uh, like for instance isoflavones and phytoestrogens and, and so on, uh, have a lot of different pharmacological profiles uh, which do not target uh, 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 only one receptor, but several receptors, and what we are trying to do is to characterize uh, uh, these several properties to target uh, at the same time uh, both neural and immune uh, mechanisms. This is, uh, uh, of course, a network involving, involving uh, several uh, different universities in, uh, in Europe, uh, and it has a training program. And this course, uh, uh, it was planned to be uh, a course uh, in the last year, so the program, this program will, will uh, last up to uh, four years, it seems to me, up to 2014. But we just decided to start with this school as a, also an opening to the, the, the training platform of this uh, uh, program. Why I tell you all these things? Just because also this program has also some open positions, uh, in particular two uh, PhD uh, positions, uh, the one which will be dedicated to the, mm, which will be included in the PhD uh, course of uh, pharmacology will be open next year, uh, ne next, next year in 2012, and, uh, and three postdoc one-year fellowships, and it seems to me that the first one, the same will be open next year, and so uh, I hope that someone will be interested maybe to join uh, us on this uh, uh, platform. 
And finally, and now I absolutely finish, but I would like to, to mention that maybe as all of you just very well know that this year the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was given to these scientists for a very nice uh, um, discoveries in the field of uh, innate and acquired immunity and how the immunity uh, just shapes uh, uh, his... Uh, its, uh, its uh, response, and so this was another Nobel Prize uh, uh, given to achievements in the field of, of uh, immunology, and it seems to me that a lot of Nobel Prizes for physiology or medicine were given to people for achievements in the field of immunology, in the field of neuroscience, uh, and uh, it, se it seems to me, and of course I strongly hope that in a few years uh, uh, time will be ready for some Nobel Prize also to in the field uh, of uh, neuroimmunology, and uh, it seems to me that in, in, in this way I strongly hope that some candidate will be also among the people who, will, uh, uh, who you will know as speakers in this course. So thank you very much, enjoy this course, uh, and it seems to me that we can go further. Thank you very much.